My passion for Frida Hansen's work goes back several years. I knew of her tapestries from books and articles and had seen individual works in museums at different times. But visiting the Frida Hansen retrospective at the Stavanger Art Museum in 2015 really set me on my path of research into her life and work. I also enjoy researching American stories of connections to Frida Hansen, like the story I'm going to tell you today. So here is Sörover, or Southward, a monumental tapestry woven by Frida Hansen in 1903. The image is based on Norse mythology. Ten maidens on swans are sailing south after bringing the sun and warmth of summer to the north. Southward was purchased and brought to the United States by a Norwegian-American woman, Berta Oskarberg, and it was viewed by thousands of Americans. And then it seemed to disappear for 90 years. It's almost one year to the day since it was displayed at the Winter Show in Manhattan, and Americans could see it again. My special relationship with Southward began with an email from Monica Ogniski when she and Bobby Tigerman began putting together the blockbuster show Scandinavian Design in the United States, 1890 to 1980. Frida Hansen's Southward was a tapestry with a deep American provenance. It was the introduction to Norwegian tapestry for many Americans as it was exhibited at museums and galleries and events in the first quarter of the 20th century. But where was it now? I was a great Nancy Drew fan as a child, and I spent my career as a librarian doing public policy research for the Minnesota legislature. Surely I could find the tapestry, I thought. Ultimately, it wasn't my research that turned up the tapestry, but I still feel like a part of the story. Frida Hansen was an amazing and influential artist. I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of her life today, but not discuss the full breadth of her career. I'll present another Westerheim webinar in more depth with many more photos of other works in July. The exact date will be set soon. So Frida Hansen was born in Stavanger, Norway in 1855, the daughter of one of the wealthiest businessmen in town. She led a sheltered and privileged life at Hillebog, an estate outside Stavanger. She showed an early interest in an art, she wanted to be a painter and had private lessons from local prominent artists, including Kitty Schelland. She married another of the wealthiest businessmen in Stavanger, Wilhelm Severin Hansen, in 1873. She was only 18. Her father died soon after, and Frida and Wilhelm moved back to Hillevog. So as Frida Hansen threw her artistic ambitions into planting extent gardens with roses and peonies and exotic flowers and birds, motifs she would weave her life. Frida and Wilhelm, three children, tragically, two would die. Her life of ease and privilege ended 10 years after her marriage. Her husband's business. So I was saying that I was just going to the thumbnail sketch today of her entire life and the breadth of her career, but there'll be another Westerheim webinar in more depth with many more photos of other works in July, and we're going to set that this week. Frida Hansen was born in Stavanger, Norway in 1855, a daughter of one of the wealthiest businessmen in town. She led a sheltered and privileged life at Hillevog, an estate outside Stavanger. She showed an early interest to be a painter and had private lessons from local prominent artists, including Kitty Schelland. She married another of the wealthiest businessmen in Stavanger, Wilhelm Severin Hansen. And I'll go back, I'll go back to the beginning of Frida Hansen's life. When she was born, when born in Stavanger in 1855, the daughter of one of the wealthiest businessmen in town. She led a sheltered and privileged life at Hillevog, an estate outside Stavanger. She showed an early interest in art. She wanted to be a painter and had private lessons from prom local prominent artists, including Kitty Schelland. She married another of the wealthiest businessmen in Stavanger, Wilhelm Severin Hansen, in 1873. She was only 18. Her father died soon after, and Frida and Wilhelm moved back to Hillevog. 
as a young wife, Frida Hansen threw all those artistic am ambitions into planting extensive gardens with roses and peonies and exotic flowers and birds, motifs she would weave her whole life. Frida and Wilhelm had three children. Tragically, two would die. Her life of ease and privilege ended 10 years after her marriage. Her husband's business went bankrupt during an economic downturn, and they were forced to move from Hillevog. Her husband went abroad to seek business opportunities. Frida was entrepreneurial and soon began an embroidery business, which would have been acceptable for a woman of her high social standing. This is in the 1880s. Now the weaving story begins. Frida Hansen was familiar with historical Norwegian weaving. She'd traveled around the countryside with her brother-in-law and admired old pieces. One day, as she described many years later, a person came to her shop and asked whether Frida could repair an old weaving. Perhaps it was one like this. Frida wrote later, suddenly I remembered my brother-in-law's words, you should weave like that. It went through fire, it went like fire through me. That's what I wanted to do. I would take up the old Norwegian weaving, renew it, make it available, and also make it a means of employment. But Frida still needed to learn how to weave, and it took some time for her to find anyone still weaving in the old techniques. She found a woman to teach her, Sherstina Hauglum. This is one of Frida Hansen's looms of the type designed by Sherstina Hauglum. It's now at Frida Hansen's house in Stavanger. This was the type of loom, or perhaps the loom, used to weave southward. There's a smaller loom in the same room. I wanted to especially show you this sideways shot on the left. You can see that the warp threads on the loom are held taut with weights that hang on the back of the loom. Here is Frida Hansen weaving at her loom around 1912. Behind her is the tapestry Jephthah's Daughter. This brings in another American connection. This tapestry was exhibited at the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh in 1915. So during the 1890s, Frida Hansen worked to rediscover old Norwegian weaving techniques and to build a thriving weaving industry to support herself and others. She started a weaving school and a dye works. She was deeply interested in the qualities of Norwegian wool and medieval tapestry techniques. This was during the era of national romanticism, when strong patriotic feelings led to the search for authentic historical folk art. In 1893, she traveled to the Chicago World's Fair to oversee the installation of textiles in the Husflitzutstilling or handcraft exhibit. The Topeka Journal reported, handsome work indeed are the embroideries and tapestries which the Norse women are producing under the leadership of Mrs. Frida Hansen, who furnishes artistic design and teaches the peasant women how to work them out. Another of Hansen's tapestries that traveled to Chicago was Mermaids and Swans, which is clearly a precursor of Southward. The fan-shaped waves are the same and the swans are very similar. Hansen also exhibited a large tapestry, Dandelion, in the women's pavilion at the fair that was commissioned by the Norwegian Feminist Association. The tapestry has complex symbolism surrounding the emancipation of women with the dandelion as the central feature, the plant that grows the more it is trod upon. Through the 1890s, Frida Hansen's style was changing and becoming more personal. This tapestry from 1894 has slightly more naturalistic figures. It's hard to see the details of Olaf Liljekrantz here. But in this detail, you can see that the faces are becoming somewhat realistic, but there are still areas in the background that resemble traditional Norwegian coverlet designs. As the images in her work moved away from Norwegian folk tales and mythology, her works were sometimes criticized as not being quite Norwegian enough or her colors were too feminine. When I look at this tapestry of Pharaoh's daughter, I imagine that those bare-breasted Egyptian girls definitely didn't look Norwegian. By the time she wove Melkevayen, or the Milky Way, in 1898, 
Her images had a definite Art Nouveau style. This is perhaps her most famous tapestry, and it was purchased by the Decorative Arts Museum in Hamburg. I displayed this in another talk, and someone asked me the meaning of the words in Hebraic letters at the bottom. So now I'm always ready. It's a Bible verse. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. There's a bit of similarity to southward here in that the female figures are moving diagonally through the picture plane. This is a tapestry that you can admire with the photograph, but you can't truly appreciate it until you can see the weaving and the technique in person. Even though we're focusing on one of Frida Hansen's large art tapestries today, I want to mention her wool open warp transparencies. She developed the technique in 1898 and even took out a patent on it. In her transparencies, she used wool warp and weft and left portions unwoven. When you view the curtains in full light, as on the left hand side, the patterns and colors dominate. If the curtain is backlit, the shining spaces of the open warps create a completely different effect. You can see that on the right. The technique is well suited to use as portieres or curtains. When closed and viewed as a flat panel, the designs can be fully appreciated. The open warps and softness of the wool warp and weft add drape and they're easily moved apart. Her transparency weavings were designed by her and woven in a workshop by other weavers. Here are photos comparing her two techniques. Her most significant art pieces, about 30 in all, are woven in what I'll call regular tapestry in the tradition of, co of continental gobelan tapestry and Norwegian billedveiv or picture weaving. All the warp is completely covered. The pink and red roses are woven in regular tapestry. Frida Hansen considered her large, fully warp-covered tapestries to be her primary, artist, her primary artistic work, and only one copy was made of each design. In the photo of the blue roses, it's in transparency. The burnt red sections are not covered with weft, they're open warps. Her transparency patterns were often woven several times, sometimes in variations. Here's an example. The design Sorte Ruser or Black Roses is owned by the Nordiska Museum in Stockholm. Frida Hansen used many different colors for the warp in her transparencies, but blue was the most popular. It's very dramatic. These peony panels hang at the Stavanger Art Museum. They have such beautiful abstracted and simple shapes and lovely variation in the warp yarns. They're likely faded. Because her transparencies were so often used as curtains, most have probably disintegrated or at least quite faded. Both Frida Hansen's tapestries and her transparent weavings had their biggest international breakthrough at the World Exhibition in Paris in 1900. The important critic Henrik Grosch wrote approvingly about Frida Hansen's work with transparencies, but felt that many of the patterns were a little too Japanese. On the other hand, he thought that her margarita, or daisies, had more in common with old Norwegian tapestry patterns because of the rows of flowers. The Paris World's Fair was a complete success for Frida Hansen. She wrote home to a friend that it was successful beyond her wildest dreams. At the fair, the French critics were not impressed with the tapestries from their own country. There was nothing new about them. They liked the Scandinavian exhibits, particularly the Norwegian, and felt they were fresh, not merely copies of paintings. So Frida Hansen was at the top of her career on many fronts during the first decade of the 20th century. Through 1906, she ran her tapestry workshop and designed many transparencies. Her international reputation soared. From 1900 to 1909, she created at least one monumental tapestry each year, and they were monumental. The Dance of Salome was woven in 1900, and it was purchased by the Decorative Arts Museum in Zurich. It's seven and a half feet high and over 22 feet long. I really need to get to Zurich to take more photos. I took these two in 2015 when it was in Stavanger. 
Look how beautiful the transparent veil is on this photo on the left. Frida Hansen was an important figure in the resurgence of interest in historical Norwegian tapestry. The old tapestries were an important source of inspiration. On the other hand, she was captivated by a panoply of other international influences. She took a study tour to Paris and Cologne in 1895 when Art Nouveau design was prominent. Asian and Japanese art was popular and shown in Scandinavia. Hansen was familiar with international publications such as the British magazine, The Studio, with articles on William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. I'll mention a couple of other notable works from the coming years, but certainly not all of them. E. Rosenhaven, or In the Rose Garden, was woven in 1904 and shows eight women wandering in a garden, wandering in nature, a dream of a golden age. It may have been influenced by the work of Gustav Klimt. And here's one of the individual ladies. Semper Vedentes is a centerpiece of the Frida Hansen room at the Stavanger Art Museum. This one is certainly filled with pattern. And here are a couple of the beautiful skirt patterns because I know that especially the weavers in the audience like to see details. But now we'll get back to the Southward story, which begins in 1903. I'm showing you the black and white image that appeared in the magazine House Beautiful in 1929, because until, until 2021, that was the best image that was available anywhere. The person who bought it, Bertea Oscar Berg, was a Norwegian American tapestry teacher and a true evangelist for Norwegian tapestry. She was a student of Frida Hansen's, and she was the one responsible for bringing Southward to the U.S. The story was related in a House Beautiful article in 1929. Berg was telling a group of American art connoisseurs in New York City that Norway has a highly developed art of weaving and that it predated many other European countries. The audience was skeptical, the article stated, so she sailed to Norway the very next week to get proof of her statements. Straight to Mrs. Hansen's studio she went, where the magnificent tapestry southward stood on the loom, nearing completion. To Mrs. Hansen she said, I must have that tapestry to take back to America. Berta Oskarberg taught Norwegian tapestry and proclaimed that she was the first person in America to teach Billedvev. She was a very strong promoter of tapestry, as you can see from this article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1928. Pupil of Frida Hansen teaches American women to forget problems while weaving pictures. Everyone knows the best thing to do with troubles is to forget them, but how? That's the problem that Mrs. Berta Aska Berg feels she has solved. Try tapestry weaving, she advises. By the time you can do it, and it takes only three or four months to be proficient, the unsolvable problems of your existence will have shrunk into nothingness and let themselves be blown away. So now we know the happiest people are tapestry weavers. So I set out to discover as much as I could about Southward in the US and hope to find clues to find out where it now was. I started with as much online research as possible. One of the miracle resources these days is newspapers.com. One of the things that surprised me in my research was how many times Frida Hansen was covered in American newspapers and not just in New York. I wouldn't have expected that a newspaper like the Butte, Montana Miner would pick up, on a, pick up a story on Frida Hansen and her revival of tapestry in Norway, especially with no pictures. Each article I found about the exhibitions was filled with glowing statements. The figures were described several ways in newspaper accounts, either as maidens, red-haired nymphs, goddesses, clean-limbed goddesses, girls, golden-haired daughters of the sun, and buxom and blonde Norse maids. This 1928 article calls the figures princesses. She was prominently Frida Hansen was prominently featured in a New York Herald magazine article in 1905. This is a quote. 
Incredible as it seems that one person could have formed and molded and sent perfect from the looms all the great pieces of Norwegian tapestry that have marked the Renaissance with such distinction, that is nevertheless true of Madame Hansen. The Norwegian government recognizes her as the soul of the noble Renaissance. I followed, my, uh, followed up on my online research with a trip to New York. At the New York Public Library archives, I looked for bulletins or catalogs from the exhibits I had identified or anything else that might show up on Frida Hansen or the tapestry's owner, Berta Oskarberg. Some tidbits were very interesting. Southward had been shown at several annual expositions of women's arts and industries in New York. In the eighth annual exposition in 1929, Berta Oscar Berg's business was listed as the Weavers, and her bio announced that she was launching a business at the exposition, a center for Norse art in America. The list of exhibitors in this exposition was wide ranging from fashion consultants to the League of Nations and the Birth Control League of America. The women's lounge was sponsored by Chesterfield with free cigarettes. I worked very hard to find photos of Southward as it hung in any of the venues, without luck. It was shown at the National Arts Club in 1908. Here's a photo of the Grand Gallery at the National Arts Club from 1908. Perhaps Southward took up one of the whole walls when it was displayed as part of the second annual exhibition of the National Society of Craftsmen. I went to the probate court in Brooklyn to check for any wills or probate records for Berta Oscar Berg or her husband. No, no luck there. I also visited the archives at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. They held many folders of materials from the Modern Tapestries exhibition at the museum in February 1931. The exhibit started at the Toledo Museum of Art, so there was a fair amount of correspondence between the museums. It was fun going back to old school research with actual papers and manila folders. An insurance document from the Toledo Museum about the pieces being sent to Brooklyn revealed that Southward had the highest insurance value of any piece and the highest price among those for sale. Um, for the most part, most tapestries sold for less than $1,000, and there were a couple that were $10,000 and $15,000, and then there was um, Southward that was on sale for $50,000. And it was interesting to me that all three of the pieces by Frida Hansen that were owned by Bertia Oskarberg were for sale at, at that exhibit in 1931. And then after 1931, the Southward Trail went cold. So where did the tapestry go? Did she sell it because she needed money during the Great Depression? That was my guess, but I was wrong. Um, I found a few later articles online about Berta Aska Berg, but they were mostly about her activities with Norwegian American organizations or who she played bridge with. So I published my article in the Norwegian Textile Letter in 2018, but I pretty much failed. I never found the tapestry. Lots of things about it, but it was still missing. Then, in the winter of 2021, I received an excited email from Peter Papp, a prominent rug dealer from New Hampshire and San Francisco. We found your tapestry, 10 maidens and swans, email me for photos, dated 1903, very large. This is where I was right then, out on a walk on the Cedar Lake Trail in Minneapolis. It was a very memorable moment. In a few days, he sent me a short video of him examining the tapestry with a colleague. It was real. I'll show you a few, a few seconds of the clip if this comes up. Here's the middle section of the tapestry. So we can see that it's this overall pattern of women riding swans. It was very cool. But where did he find it? in a Rubbermaid container. His friend David McGinnis, an antiques dealer, had passed away unexpectedly, and his family hired Peter to handle his estate, 
including the bulk of his inventory. Peter described his friend as a generalist who had a good eye for something special. He was the sort of dealer to whom inventory felt like money in the bank, assets that would appreciate in value. Unfortunately, he died before selling many of his treasures. David McInnes left no records of when he purchased Southward. His family's best guess is around 2010. His family knew that David owned a large Scandinavian tapestry that he felt was important, but nothing more. It was too large to display in their home, so when Peter Papp found it, it was in a plastic tub in a storage building. He opened the box, unfolded the tapestry, and checked Google on his phone. He found my article within a couple of minutes, and he knew exactly what he had. That summer, I traveled to Dublin, New Hampshire to see the tapestry. This was my first glimpse in the rug gallery. Southward was so big. That was a 13 foot wall, 13 foot high wall, and it had so much color. And the maidens were nearly life sized. We spent a good hour examining all of the details. I was still asked to keep it a secret as Peter Papp decided how best to sell it. He notified some museums, but it wasn't sold. He decided to offer it at the prestigious Winter Show in Manhattan, an art and antique show. It's usually held in January, but was delayed to April 2022 because of the Omicron COVID surge. It was amazing to see the details. So far, I had only seen the grainy black and white image. Here, the heads of the maidens were of two types, either a full side view or a sort of three quarters facial view. But a lot of care went into the hair of each figure and no two were the same. The swans are fairly similar, <clears throat> excuse me, but the ribbon like reins are all unique and very beautiful. Some maidens are leaning forward, some slightly back. Some have dresses with roses, a common motif in Frida Hansen's tapestries. The other dresses have a ribbon-like pattern. The designs in the dresses and the dots in the bonnets and parts of the reins are woven with silver-colored thread. Early reviews of the tapestry said that the shining silver threads gave a transparent effect. Now those areas are oxidized to a beautiful copper brown. I think it speaks to her design genius that the image is just as beautiful now and the graphic impact is just as strong. We examined both the front and the back. Here I can point out that Frida Hansen wove in the traditional billetweb style of Norwegian tapestry in that all the ends on the back are woven in. The back is as beautiful as the front. It was also the same color. The front didn't seem faded or sun damaged. As it turns out, the tapestry was not faded, but equally dusty on both sides. Peter told me the tapestry was in need of thorough cleaning. How can you tell, I asked him. From seeing hundreds of thousands of rugs during my career, he told me, the robin's egg blue when the border will pop and portions that are now a sort of oatmeal shade will brighten to undyed ivory. The tapestry needed cleaning before its debut at the winter show, and it was so it was sent to Robert Mann Rugs in Denver, Colorado. I had the pleasure of watching the process. When it was taken from the box in Denver, I was startled. When I first saw the tapestry in Peter Papp's studio in New Hampshire, I was bowled over by the beautiful colors. Now dust seemed to fly in clouds like the pig pen character in Charles Schultz's cartoons. That's a bit of an exaggeration but it was clear that cleaning was in order. It made perfect sense to me when Robert Mann explained that all the fuzzy wool fibers in the tapestry were clinging to 120 years of dust. The tapestry was laid out on a large table for evaluation, vacuuming, and preparation for washing. Robert Mann was amazed at the good condition of the tapestry. No moth holes, no tears, no stains. There was a small darned patch in an upper corner, which he said was common. It probably repaired a hole from a nail. I bet there's one on the other corner, he said, and he was right. 
this is the this light blue area on in this photo is the is the darned patch from from a nail probably. He conducted several blotting tests with water, mild detergent, and solvent to test all to test the dyes for color fastness before the tapestry was washed. He removed a burlap heading band that was sewn to the top edge, and I got to help carefully remove the stitches. You could see from dark lines running vertically on the header up here that metal clips of some sort had been sewn to the burlap. When the band was removed, there was a surprise, a hidden part of the tapestry. The solid colored border at the top edge of the tapestry had been turned under about two inches. Before a textile is washed, the delicate areas need to be stabilized. In this case, the warps on either end of the tapestry were encased in a wire mesh pocket. The tapestry was washed three times, and I think you can see the 120 years of dust being released into the water. This was during the first bath. This was the result. It's really hard to take photos that are completely true but there was an amazing difference. And it was just as Peter Papp had predicted. It wasn't necessarily that the whole tapestry became phenomenally brighter, but the contrast between subtle shades of color popped and you could see the true genius of her design. The swans are so beautiful. The brown portion of the reins are the metallic thread. During the washing, it didn't change color, but became perceptibly shinier. In this picture, you can also appreciate the color variation in the blue waves. So now we'll move to the debut of Southward at the Winter Show. It was definitely one of the top items. This just shows the double spread that was in the catalog. A dealer in antique Chinese furniture stopped by the booth when I was there and he said, this is the most beautiful object in the show and I've been through the whole show twice. Visitors at the Winter Show were amazed at the beauty of the tapestry and interested in the related stories of Frida Hansen as an artist and the interesting history of the tapestry in the U.S. This young couple who came to the opening night were definitely my best dressed visitors. I loved his green cut velvet suit. One young woman, a reporter at Women's Wear Daily, asked many questions and then commented, they look like strong women. That's true of the women depicted in Hansen's tapestries, and it's almost always women. They're active, not passive or frail. Peter Papp added, yes, they have biceps. Here's Peter Papp on opening night, and in front of the velvet ropes he put up, he put up to keep visitors at arm's length. I love an opening with champagne. A benefit of spending those days at the show with Southward and having many discussions with visitors is that I continue to notice new aspects. One day, Bobby McGinnis, the son of the antique dealer who owned it and who had acquired Southward was in the booth too. He grew up on the ocean and he pointed out some of the clever aspects of the seaweed in the borders, like these ruffled edges of the seaweed that sort of turned over on itself. Peter Papp noticed how portions of the design went under other portions and then reappeared. You see on this left, you see this seaweed with the little globules going under and then coming out here. So it's a complex layered design. The blue muscles around the border remained my favorite part. Southward was featured as one of the top artworks at the Winter Show by the New York Times. So Southward wasn't discovered before the book about the Scandinavian design exhibition was published. That's too bad. The exhibit was mounted in Stockholm and Oslo without it too. But Southward was discovered and available in time to be included in the exhibit when it was at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art from last November through this February. And now Southward is just displayed prominently at the Scandinavian Design Show at the Milwaukee Museum of Art. And, and this is a bad 
much too exposed photo. The show opened last week and will be up through July 23rd. I highly recommend planning a trip to Milwaukee. Southward is stunning, of course, but textile lovers will be thrilled with many other pieces too. So when Southward was found and revealed to the world again, the mystery wasn't completely solved. Where had the tapestry been since 1931 when it seemed to be mentioned and up until the time it was likely purchased by its last owner, antique dealer David McGuinness around 2010? A piece of that puzzle came to light through family history research that was being done by a relative of Berta Oskarberg's son's wife. It appears that Berta Oskarberg, the owner of Southward, didn't sell it, but passed it on to her son, Norman Berg, when she died in 1954. Norman Berg died soon after in 1958 in Keene, New Hampshire. He was married to Elizabeth White Griffin Berg, who, who died only three years later in 1961 in the same town. They had no children, so the bulk of their estate was sold at auction. William Griffin, a cousin of Elizabeth Berg, found all my articles about Southward online and wrote to tell me of his discovery. I mentioned, so you can see up here, this is the auction listing from 1961 when Elizabeth Baird died and they, they list the tapestry Southward. And I think this was a valuation. It wasn't a selling price. I mentioned before that all my diligent research never turned up the tapestry or completely solved the mystery but it certainly helps to have a lot of information online for other people to find. He also sent me a brochure from yet another exhibition of Southward that I had not discovered. But of course, the mystery of the provenance of Southward is still not completely solved. Who bought Southward at the auction in Keene, New Hampshire in 1961? And where was it until around 2010 when David McGinnis purchased it? All we know is that it was cared for very well. Peter Papp plans to do some follow-up at the county courthouse. Perhaps there are records listing the name of the auction house. Maybe the auction house still exists. It's worth a try. There's more Frida Hansen mystery tapestry research to be done. Remember the Mermaids and Swans tapestry I mentioned was exhibited at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893? It was sold, but the only information about the buyer is that they were from California and it's still missing. Another Frida Hansen tapestry is missing in the US. One of Frida Hansen's descendants found a photo of the tapestry and wrote to ask if I could find out more information. It was sold to the Academy of Arts in Honolulu, which is now the Honolulu Museum of Art. I discovered that it was deaccessioned by the museum in 1954 and sold to a local buyer. Unfortunately, the very helpful museum staff person was not able to give me a name. He even tried contacting the family of the buyer to get permission, but received no answer. I've written posts on my blog about both of these missing tapestries, and I'll have Andrew send on those links. Let me know if you can solve the mysteries. I'll finish by answering the question I know someone will ask, has the tapestry sold? It hasn't. I know there's still interest by Norwegian museums and lately Peter Papp has been in discussion with an American museum. I don't expect you to read the small print on this listing on Peter Papp's website, but the important thing is call for price. If you'd like to buy it and donate it to Festerheim, I'd love to have it close to my home. So thank you for listening to me talk about my fascination with the story of Southward. I always have the image nearby, as close as my wrist. My contact information is on this screen. Feel free to contact me later with any questions or comments, or when you find those missing tapestries. Okay. This was just fabulous. I am so glad we were able to get the tech issues solved. This is just an incredible 40 minutes of information. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing all of it. So Greg and I are now going to take turns fielding questions. 
um, and passing them to you. And we have one in the Q&A right now. Others are certainly going to be flooding in, but um, we I am aware that we are at the official end time for today's program, but we are gonna keep going because I know we wanna have a few questions get answered here. Um, if you need to log off now, we will make sure that this is included in the YouTube uh, video when it is posted. All right, Robbie, one of the questions that has come in is if you could tell us more about the cleaning process. Was it immersed in a large shallow bath? Was it done mostly portion by portion? How did that happen? It was immersed in a large bath. And what was amazing is I thought, well, how did they have how would they have um how would they have baths or tubs that are that big and they created the tub by putting um I think they were probably water filled tubes around and that's how they can make a container that's exactly the size of the tapestry or rug that is being put in the water and that's how they kept the water and it was on a you know like a garage floor kind of um but it slanted a tiny bit so that when they were done soaking it for the first time, then they would open the side and the water would just flow out. And then mm -hmm. they would replace clean water for a second washing. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Another question in the chat is coming from Tommy, and I think I'll pass this one to you also because it's in the same world of the cleaning and the dyes. Are the dyes natural? Is the blue indigo? And is, um, my personal addition to this is, is there any risk when they submerge, submerge it into a large pool like that of the dyes running in bleeding into each other? Um, well, a couple of things. I, I was so impressed with the work that Robert Mann did. And of course, Peter Papp, having handled hundreds of thousands of textiles in his life, trusted Robert Mann. Um, but the the amount of testing he did was sort of phenomenal. So he would have uh, some detergent that perhaps was even stronger than the the level of that was stronger than the level of detergent they would have in the um, in the actual bath. And they would he would test it cloth and and blotting, and um, there was nothing that ran. So her dyes were impeccable. Um, she did dye all of her own yarn, Frida Hansen did, and she actually had a dye works at, at some point. I can't tell you that all of the, I'm not an expert, and I can't tell you whether all of the dyes were natural. And I can't say whether the, dye, the dyes were indigo, but I assume so. And let me just tell you one fun story. I had an email conversation with a woman who works for the city of Oslo and they are charged with uh, maintaining the house that Frida Hansen moved to in the early 19 in the very early 1900s it's called Bestem House, and that's where she had her studio and her home and so that is still exists and she was um She's in the government office that helps to maintain the home or watches for it. And she said that upstairs on one of the floors is was the dye room. And she said she can still see the flecks of dye from all of Fried Hansen's dyeing over the years. So I thought that was, it would be very cool to see. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, I just want to do, uh, jump in with a few questions for you, Robbie. Uh, let me pull those up real quick for you um do you know what uh Freda Hansen's uh tapestry weaving like her setup was at the time like what her workspace would look like at the time and then also is there anything about the tri the um men and women of Norway at that time in terms of weaving like what the uh there are any notable male weavers as well or the what the history of that would be um, I don't know of any notable male weavers um, at the time. So Frida Hansen really was a leader in, in Europe and maybe the world in that she was an artist who also who designed her own images and wove her tapestries. 
the tradition generally has been in the centuries before that, that um, there would be people who draw cartoons and those were often men and then women. Well, in Norway at that time, it was generally women who were the weavers. So Gerhard Munte was somebody that many people probably uh, recognize his name and you would recognize his sort of folk tale tapestries. He was an artist who designed tapestry cartoons, but he did not weave. And I don't, I don't exactly know about her setup other than there was that one photo about Frida Hansen at her loom in 1912. So it looked like she was in a fairly spacious room with the one of her large tapestries on the far wall. But other than that, I don't really know about her setup. Great. So a question that came in the chat also is, what are your next Frida Hansen inspired weaving projects? Oh, since I was um, in Stavanger in 2019, I've come home and I've created four you know, large, <laughs> nothing on this scale. And most of her, uh, Frida Hansen's portieres or curtains were probably door sized. And I've done four pieces that are about 30 inches by 24 inches. And I plan to continue to do that. But, and I have been examining her technique to the best of my abilities, and I'm going to teach workshops. There are two, one is coming up at Westerheim in uh, September. And uh, you can say when that'll be available uh, to sign up for, and another for the San Diego Weavers Guild. So right now, this summer, I'm just doing lots of samples and smaller pieces and trying to develop um, perhaps a small project that that the weavers, that the students could do in a, in a short time. Wonderful. And then I think we have time for probably two more questions. Greg, do you want to ask one of them? Yes, I believe there are like two questions uh, perfectly to fill up the last two. Uh, we have, um, do you know who is lending the tapestry to the Nordic exhibit in Milwaukee? And then a, another question is, did Frida ever work with other weavers or did they do this all themselves? Um, well, it's Peter Papp. It's the dealer who is selling it on behalf of the family of David McGinnis, the antique dealer who found it. So it's Peter Papp and the family who have given permission for it to be in the exhibit in Los Angeles and Milwaukee. And what was the second question? Uh, did uh, Frida ever work with others? Like did their work, was it like a teamwork or is it all just them? Well, she, um, oh, yeah, she had a large studio, the Norske Billedweveri, or the Norwegian Tapestry Studio, that existed up through 1906, and she had up to 20 weavers in the studio. So she definitely worked with others. And people ask, did she, did she weave these enormous tapestries by herself? And I kind of assume she had some help, although she definitely worked on them, but she was also designing other transparencies and you know, running the tapestry studio. Um, <clears throat> there's a quote from a newspaper in the book that Anna Kintua wrote about Frida Hansen, which is only in Norwegian, but it's, um, it's something like, my God, if we only had more women of her energy. So she was, she, she was very busy. So I assume she even had help on those big ones. But uh, notably, she taught a lot of people to weave in her transparency technique. And I'm also interested in all of the followers of Frida Hansen. Um, so I've been trying to find as much information as I can about pieces that were woven by some of her followers. Fabulous. Well, Reagan has added a comment in the chat, and I think it sums things up absolutely beautifully. Dear Robbie, thank you for completing the search and uncovering the Frida Hansen tapestry. Your true grit has left us all. This has been just a fabulous hour. We are so grateful to you for having done all of the work leading into the discovery and then sharing the story of the discovery with us. 